Okay. While you ponder whether you had the choice to press the button to continue this or take this class or pay attention, uh, let's go on to talk about some of the Im influential uh, people and theories that, that go into motivation. Okay, we can't, we can't really start any good motivation class without talking about pleasure, hedonism. It's a good place to start because it's what we think about first when we think about, well, what caused this behavior? Well, I thought it, it would be a good outcome. I thought the outcome would be pleasurable. I mean, the idea of, of goodness, of, of happiness, is, is it's part of our country. It's part of our Constitution. A declaration of independence had our pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, there's a couple of ways to think about hedonism, the idea that we are motivated by pleasure. There's the psychological hedonism. Humans are psychologically constructed in such a way that we exclusively desire pleasure. It's the way that our brain has evolved. It's the way that our brain is set up to pay attention to pleasurable events, to learn about them, to correlate them with with the behaviors that preceded them. It's how we're set up. Then there's the idea of what's called ethical hedonism. It's the view that our fundamental moral obligation is to maximize pleasure or happiness. Sounds a little selfish, but it does, the pleasurable outcome doesn't always have to be eating chocolate and sex and people fanning you with palm fronds, but it's the idea that uh, the ethical hedonism is the idea that we are uh, obligated to do this. The idea of hedonism has been, you know, fundamental to philosophy. Epicurus, you know, one of the fierce, we recognize pleasure as the first good innate in us. And from pleasure we begin every act of choice and avoidance. And to pleasure we return again using the feeling as the standard by which we judge every good. But hedonism has been the cornerstone of a lot of philosophers from a long time ago, but current theories and ideas in psychology. And you don't need to know all these people. I'm not going to ask you a question. Name all five people that... Now, I just wanted to point out, and we're going to talk about Thorndike a little, and we're going to talk about Freud a little bit, but these are the idea that behavior is motivated by pleasurable outcomes. If pleasure facilitates um, behavior, then what is pleasurable? A stimulus is pleasurable if it increases the behavior which precedes it. Well, that seems a bit circular. Um, how do you know something was pleasurable? Because the behavior that preceded it increased. What increases behavior? Pleasurable outcomes. That's kind of circular in the way that we're thinking about it. It's not well defined. But what is pleasurable is also very subjective. I mean, it might be pleasurable for you to spend three hours having somebody uh, uh, put a needle on your arm and inject ink into your um, hypodermis, I think it's, you know. That's going to cause a lot of pain, but y you do it, so there must be something pleasurable outcome. What about skydiving? For some, there could think you could think of nothing worse. For others, think of nothing better. Uh, anybody here go to Star Trek conventions? Come on. I know. You got the ears. You go. What is pleasurable and painful depends on the individual. Not easy to define. Again, the physicists and the chemists have it a lot easier in trying to understand their science. Strict pleasure is not the only thing that can motivate behavior. For example, let's, let's take this. A, a rat will press a lever, learn to press a lever, to get glucose injected into its tail. Now, this doesn't exactly feel very good, but it increases the amount of sugar the animal needs, and so it 
it's rewarding. It's not necessarily pleasurable, but still acts as a reward. Here's another example. Uh, a male rat will run to the end of a maze to get to a female rat that's in estrus. You know, it's ready for mating. Even if the female is co co um, constantly removed upon his arrival. Now, this does not necessarily imply pleasure. Rat's running really hard, gets there, female's removed, and the rat's going to get very frustrated, but they're going to continue to do it. So here we have a, an outcome that's not be, uh, pleasurable, at least to the rat, but still it motivates the behavior. The behavior is motivated. So there's also, we need to consider the cost-benefit. There is a trade-off between the intensity or magnitude of the reinforcement and the energy or difficulty of the behavior. Um, in the coming sections, not this one, we're really going to get into the economics and mathematics of the relationship between energy and reinforcement. Contiguity is very important. Contiguity means together. And like I mentioned in an early lecture, the behavior and the outcome have to be contiguous, have to be close together for it to act as a reward. Both behavior and punishment are better when they are immediately after the behavior. There's also a trade-off between the intensity or magnitude of the reinforcement and the delay to receive it. I mean, we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit, but here's the idea. Uh, if I offered you $100 right now, how much would I have to offer you to wait a whole year to get money? Would you do it for $105? A year from now, I'll give you $105 compared to $100 now. Well, not really, but you'd probably earn that in a bank. What about 200 What about 300 How much does the magnitude have to increase to forego the delay? This gets into the issue of self-control. Self-control and impulsiveness. This is, they talk about it on page 26, but we're going to talk about it more in the future. It's one of the things that I study with my animals. And self-control meaning foregoing a, a small reward to get a big reward later. Impulsiveness meaning taking the immediate reward. It's one of those great transitions in children. Ask a child three years old, you say, I'll give you one cookie now, or five cookies in half an hour. Well, they'll take that first cookie. But as they get four and five and six years old, they begin to show that self-control. Now, this idea of self-control and impulsiveness plays probably a much bigger role in your life than you think about. Um, this relationship between reward and delay, um, uh, uh, the delay of reward, is really interesting to biologists, ec uh, economists, psychologists, um, you know, we see this all the time. Get, get ten thousand dollars in credit now and pay nothing for three years. Well, we we think about that. The money now versus what we have to do to pay it off in three years. The money now has so much greater value to us. Buying candy at the checkout stand because the reward is so quickly received. Do you, who, you know, you probably have done this before. You know, you 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 get that candy right now. If you had to buy that candy way on the other side of the store and wait uh, of 10 minutes to get to the checkout, it wouldn't be as valuable as that immediate reward. That's why the checkout person always hands it to you. We talked about this before, self-control and child development. It not only marks uh, certain developmental stages, but it can tell us a lot about the personality um, of that child by how they deal with self-control. We're going to do a lot of this in, uh, in, in a few sections from now. The principle of utility is also very important because we have to understand the reward in terms of how it benefits the, um, the individual, the animal, or the person. It, it, it can increase happiness by increasing pleasure or decreasing pain. It has a lot to do with context. The same reward, m the same reward might motivate behavior uh, differently because it has different utility. For example, take an animal who has eaten a lot of food. They are motivated to do behaviors to receive more food. However, an animal that's very hungry 
will be highly motivated, even though it's the same reward in both cases. Suppose I offered you $200 to wash my car. Well, would you do it? I'm not offering you $200 to wash my car, but let's say I did. I'm telling you right now, if you give me $200, I'll wash your car. Not really? No, seriously. Because $200 has a great utility for me. But what about, what about Bill Gates? What if I offered him $200 uh, to, to wash my car? Now he has, what, $43, $50 billion? Would that same amount have the same utility or usefulness to him? Sorry, sort of made me laugh. We get into what's called utility functions. Now here is what's called an increasing decelerating function or a, and a utility function. The magnitude, as magnitude goes up, that's on the lower x-axis, utility also goes up, but it's not linear. Utility here in the y-axis is the subjective nature of the reward. The x-axis is its magnitude. So, let's take a look at this. Let's say you start down here. This is how much money you have. It's probably about how much money I have. And I increase it by a certain amount, that much. Well, you can see the incredible increase in utility by that amount of money. It goes from there all the way up to there. I've increased utility, increased happiness. Well, so to, say, so to speak. But what if I started off here? What if I started off very well off in terms of having a lot of money or having a lot of food or something like this in another animal? If I increase it by the same amount as I did before, it doesn't really change my utility very much. These are important economic theories, but it, it's also important just to sort of a on a day-to-day -day basis and how people are motivated with everything from credit cards and bank loans and, and, and a number of other choices. You can also think of utility functions when it comes to delay. Okay, That the uh, a short delay way over there on the left side of the x-axis has a great utility, but if you have to wait for it, the utility becomes less and less and less. It's the $100 now versus $100 in a year. That $100 now has great utility. The $100 in a year is not very valuable, at least in your perspective and how it motivates your behavior. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the history of motivation and psychology. Edward Thorndike came about in the United States just about the time Pavlov was working. We'll talk about Pavlov in a bit. And he was interested in looking at animal learning and animal intelligence um, and how that related to human learning, but from a really strict parsimonious experimental methodology. So he wanted to look at animal behavior but not make these leaps of assumption. So here's an example of some experiments that he did. He started off with this, what's called a puzzle box. Very simply, the cat presses that pink lever there, the door opens, and out they go. The question is, does the animal understand how it works, or can we think about this without this sort of conscious, logical reasoning that might be taking place in, uh, in these animals? Here's another picture. In this case, the reward is is food or fish. So Thorndike observed how long it took for the cat to get out and what it found is what he found was that if you put the cat back in it took less and less time to get out but the animal didn't go in right away after getting out and press the lever. It took them um, a process of what's called trial and error learning. A process of stopping the behaviors that don't produce a good outcome, maybe over on the other side of the cage, and continuing behaviors that do, maybe being near the lever. And this process was slow. It was a trial and error learning that took many trials. 
So here is a graph of what might uh, what we might see in an animal. Put the cat in, and on the first trial, see the trials, it took maybe 80 seconds to get out. On the next trial, it took maybe 60, then 75, then did well, and slowly through a process of learn by doing, as that, as um, Thorndike described it, the animal learns to get out. Now, if I stuck you into these one of these boxes and you pressed that lever and you got out, you'd be almost have instantaneous uh, recognition that the lever was, was linked to the uh, door opening and you'd be able to go in and get out anytime you want. So without assuming sort of this cognitive or logical reasoning in the animals, he said the animals learn over the course of many experiences. So Thorndike called this type of conditioning instrumental learning, instrumental conditioning, because their behavior was instrumental in producing a good outcome. Uh, Skinner came along a bit later uh, after Thorndike from Thorndike's work and some other very influential people um, such, as, such as Hall, uh, Clark Hall. And, and Skinner um, really brought this type of learning, this reward-based or punish-based learning, um, really into the public eye and did a lot of work on automating these procedures. He called it operant conditioning because the animal operates on the lever or operates on the action. So here's a few other techniques used for instrumental conditioning. Well, here's a Skinner box or uh, a operant chamber sometimes they call. Here's a little rat presses the lever, and when it does press the lever, it gets a little nibble of food. This is all automated. Skinner was very good at automating to be what, what uh, the equipment that they used. Automation is very important in animal behavior research because if you are using your own personal subjective interpretation of the behavior, you can run into a lot of problems uh, in terms of methodology. So here, the everything is automated, recorded by a computer. Here are some other uh, typical things. Sometimes you see big mazes, but in this case you can maybe just use a simple T maze. The animal starts at the bottom, goes up, wa uh, walks up, takes a right, finds food, takes a left, finds something else, um, and, or a Y maze. Um, and so these are ways of the behavior is followed by a good or uh, bad outcome, and we measure simple choice. In fact, this is what I... One of the techniques I use in my lab, this is a what's called a plus maze, which is essentially a, a tea maze um, with a little area over there for a heater, and the fish goes down, takes a right, gets to fight with another fish, takes a left, gets to fight with a fish maybe for a longer period of time. Maybe it's a better fish to fight with. And we look at the animal's preference um, for going left and right and what it's learned um, by how it changes its choices over the course of training. Okay, now, Thorndike's empirical law of effect was a way of theorizing about what's happening in the animal's brain and theorizing about empirically what we see. Empirically means from observation. Of several responses made to the same situation, those of which uh, are accompanied by satisfaction to the animal will be more likely to occur, and those followed by discomfort to the animal will be less likely to occur. Okay, that makes sense. So animals learn by doing. According to Thorndike, for an animal to learn, they must participate in the behavior. They must be doing the behavior. Can't just learn without the action. This became very important because Thorndike spent a, most of his career writing books about teaching teachers how to teach, how to teach small children. And his cornerstone of this was get them out of the seat and get them participating in what they do because we learn by doing. Okay, there must be action and for learning to take place. So in addition to the empirical law of effect, what we see from observation, Thorndike formulated what he called the theoretical law of effect of what is happening in the animal's brain. Now this is not in the book, but it's something I'd really like you to know. So what is being learned? According to Thorndike, what is happening is the animal is making a connection in the brain, an associative connection, neural connection, um, between the stimuli and the behavior if what follows is rewarding. 
So you have a behavior that the animal does, pressing a lever, getting out of a box. There are certain stimulations that occur before that. Now, what happens is when the animal experiences those stimulations again, there is a good chance of the behavior occurring again. So the animal creates a stimulus response association. Now, he also said that those kinds of associations are lost if what follows is bad or aversive. This is punishment. I'm going to give you several examples of this in the coming slides. It might be a little confusing at first. Okay, well this is a quote from Thorndike's book to, uh, of really the theoretical law of effect of several responses made to the same situation, to the same stimuli, those which are accompanied or followed closely by satisfaction to the animal other things being equal, will be more firmly connected to that situation. Stimulus connected to the response. So that when it occurs again, the stimulus occurs again, they will be more likely to recur the behavior. Those which are accompanied closely by discomfort, all things being equal, have their connections lost or weakened. Okay? So, according to Thorndike, um, the animal doesn't really learn about the outcome, doesn't learn that the actions produce the outcome, produce the reward. They learn an association between the stimulus that precedes the behavior and the behavior itself. So the behavior, the probability of the behavior occurring um, increases when what follows is rewarding, but it increases in the presence of that specific stimulus. So this doesn't require representation of the outcome, it doesn't require conscious thought, and it's a very simple, very simple mechanistic way of understanding learning. I simply learn that when presented with a stimulus to automatically do the behavior, it does not require consciousness or cognitive thought. This is a form of implicit learning. Okay, so here we go. Here's little Mr. Rat. Goes up, presses the lever, and gets himself a, a cheese. Presses the button. So according to Thorndike, according to his law of effect, what has the rat learned? Think about that. Okay, what's the rat learned here? Does it learn that if I press the lever, I get cheese? No. Does it learn that the lever is associated with cheese? No. The rat has learned that the presence of the stimulus is associated with the behavior of pressing it. The stimulus lever, the side of it, causes the action of pressing the lever. This is known as a stimulus response. The connection or association is created between the stimulus and the response when what follows is good. So the reward functions to create this connection. So we have these connections strengthening. Behaviors are caused by the stimuli that precede them. Again, doesn't require consciousness. This is implicit memory or non-declarative sometimes it's referred to. Yeah. Okay, here's an example of stimulus response kind of learning. If you've ever driven a stick shift for a while, you hear the rev of the engine, vroom, you press the clutch and you shift. Vroom, press the clutch and you shift and you get into this habit. Okay? This habit of action. Now, what is causing this behavior? Now, the outcome is good because the car keeps going, doesn't stall, uh, doesn't make a loud sound. You get into this habit and you don't think about it. Rev of the engine, press the clutch, and shift. Now, if you ever go then into an automatic car, borrowing somebody's car, renting a car, you hear the rev of the engine, mm, your leg starts looking for the clutch that's not there, and your hand starts reaching for the, sh the gear shift that's not there. You get into these automatic behaviors. If consciously you go, I'm in an automatic car. But these habits, these strengthened habits, increase. We get into these a lot. Okay, so stimulus response learning has played a major role in understanding many aspects of learned behavior. Now let's keep in mind, this doesn't uh, account for all of our learning and all of our behavior. But it's a first place to start. We start with a parsimonious theory. A lot to do with drug addiction. We will talk about this theory. Why do people take drugs? What causes the craving behavior? It's usually the side of the bottle or the side of the drug. 
uh, understanding simple foraging actions in animals, some of the stuff I do. I do. Early education. Remember, Thorndike wrote a lot of books about learn by doing, by action, especially real early infant development. They learn by action and doing and continue behaviors that uh, are followed with reward. And a lot of muscle memory is Thorndikean in a sense, stimulus response, sports. So a baseball player, ball comes in and they swing at it or they don't swing at it, you know, that ball is coming 90, 95 miles an hour. They don't have a lot of time to consciously process that information. It's a curve ball, it's, it's this fast, it's outside the plate. To get good at it, you simply have to swing at a lot of balls. Over and over again, you swing at the baseball, and sometimes the behavior is followed by a good outcome. The ball gets hit. And so the stimulus, the sight of the ball, in that area where it's coming, and the swinging become connected. And so you increase the probability of hitting the ball. Now, when I was a kid and, and in college, I was on the, on the springboard diving team, and I used to like gymnastics. And a lot of these actions have to be stimulus response. They can't be thought, thought through. You know, if you're going to dive off a diving board and do uh, a one and a half somersault and do three twists all within 1.2 seconds, there's not a lot of time to think of action. So it's stimulus response. How do you get good at something? How do you facilitate these behaviors? by doing the behaviors, by practicing. Okay, and now to Pavlov, who worked in a different type of area of learning, but also looked at these simple, reductionistic, parsimonious ways of interpreting learning and behavior. Uh, he was a physiologist. He worked in Russia. So he was worked in medicine, and he worked on digestion in animals. He won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine, not for his work on conditioning, classical conditioning, but his work on medicine in 1904, dealing with the process of digestion. He noticed that when he uh, would come in to feed the animals, before feeding them, they, they would begin to salivate. And that can mess up an experiment if you're interested in the digestive of system of animals and the animal starts producing salivation and digestive enzymes before they eat, that's troublesome. But it also led to new thinking about those associations. Theorized uh, about how the animal had come to connect him, Pavlov, with food. That's what he worked on for the latter part of his life. Okay, so you take a neutral stimulus, a light, a buzzer, a tone, which produces no salivation, for example, in a dog. Pair the light with food, food produces salivation, and eventually the dog naturally salivates to, uh, sorry, the dog naturally salivates to food, and so it begins to salivate to the light. It connects those two. Okay, so here's the dog. The light comes on, pair that with food, and the animal salivates. Now it's salivating to the food. That's a natural response. But because the light and the food are presented together in time, this is known as contiguity, temporal contiguity in time, they begin to connect in the brain. So eventually, light comes on and the animal salivates to the light because of that association. Okay. Now, you may have seen this with pets of your own. If you, if you uh, put on a can opener for uh, cat food, the cat comes running. That sound is associated with food. The natural response to food is to move toward it. So the condition response is to move towards that sound. Okay. Again, here is, here is the basic notion of Pavlov, Pavlovian conditioning. It all has to do with time. It all has to do with temporal relationships between two events. The first can begin to produce the same response as the second. Okay, salivate to food, salivate to the bell or light. Okay, so let's, maybe this is a bit of a review for intro psychology. There's an innate reflex, an unconditioned, unlearned stimulus like food produces an unconditioned response, salivation. We're born to do this. There is no response to the, to the light, the conditioned stimulus at the beginning. 
but bring them together. Light food, light food, light food, and the animal begins to associate. The brain is designed to do this. This is how animals, any animal with a nervous system, a synaptic nervous system, anything from a flatworm and insects and worms and fish and reptiles and birds and people and, and furry creatures are set up to make connections in their environment. When two things happen together, we connect them. That's how we're set up. And that's really what classical conditioning is all about. Two stimuli together in time, often enough, we start saying one predicts the other. This is also implicit or non-declarative. We don't need a conscious response to do this. Okay, so imagine this big pink thing is your brain, okay? And it has a area of the brain that is stimulated to an unconditioned stimulus. You eat food, this part of the brain is activated, okay? And this area is automatic, innate, con innately connected to a response center. You eat food, it connects to the response center for salivation, so you salivate in your mouth so you can break down the food. Okay? Now if the CS, like a light, is paired with the US in time, they begin to form excitatory connections or excitatory associations. Okay? And you do this enough times, they become a very strong association so that when the CS is presented, it activates the part of the brain that is, a, that is usually activated to food, the U.S. center. And that is connected to the response, so you respond. Okay? Now, it could be, if you do this enough, that you simply connect the light to the response center. After all, the response center is activated at the same time as the light is when the light and the food are paired. Two things activated at the same time in the brain, they connect. So you create this conditioned response either directly CS to a condition response, or which is known as an SR connection, or a stimulus-stimulus connection. Light, food powder center, and response. This is also a form of implicit learning, so we don't need to be conscious about it. I mean, for example, if you walk into Kentucky Fried Chicken, at least I do, and they have the barbecue honey wings, you know which ones I'm talking about, and they fill the air with this odor, you begin to produce salivation in your mouth. You pr begin to produce digestive enzymes. Now, you're not able to do that consciously. Can you produce digestive enzymes in your uh, stomach consciously? Can you control that like you control your arm muscle? No. So these are subconscious things. Okay? Um, and what Pavlov and Thorndike are really trying to get at is that a lot of our behaviors are learned and kept at an unconscious level and yet affect your behavior. So there are a lot of areas like this that are important to understand in the motivation of behavior at a reductionistic, in this case, subconscious level. So look, t take, for example, advertisement. I mean, advertisement at a conscious level shouldn't really work. We shouldn't go, oh, I'm going to be a cowboy if I smoke these cigarettes. Or I'll be able to meet these pretty, this pretty girl if I eat Doritos. And that's, it's not like that. Really, it's about pre presenting two stimuli together. We have a natural response to the cowboy or, or to the, the pretty model or the American flag. We have these, or, or these learned responses to these things. So all you got to do is bring a stimuli together with it, and they're associated. Okay? So Doritos, pretty girl together. Okay? Uh, cigarettes and cowboy. Um, American flag and George Bush, you bring them together and you associate them. And they're not at a conscious level, but they do influence your behavior. Why do we know they influence their behavior? We look at it in the lab with rats, but we also know that this works. This advertisement style works. Phobias are a really good example of a subconscious uh, type of learning. Okay? You have a bad experience with a spider when you're a kid or with a dog, and those objects produce fear. I mean, I think some of you are looking at this spider and looking away. I can't stand looking at this spider. It's making, it's making my heart race. It's doing all these things. We're going to talk about phobias in coming lectures.